be seated. Amen, church. Joy it is. What an incredible, worthy God that we serve and be able to sing and worship with you this morning. What a privilege it is. And now we get to do what we love to do here at Reclamation Church, and that is dive into God's Word. As a church, we've been walking through the Gospel of John, and our goal has been trying to get to John 20 on Resurrection Easter Sunday. And so we are here. Um, so open your Bibles up to John chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible, I hope you grab one in front of you and pull it out and look at it with us. We are going to look at the story of the resurrection today. And I would love for you to be able to follow along with us in God's Word because it doesn't matter what Jeremiah says. It is God's Word that is important. And so I want you to be able to see what we talk about today come straight from the Word of God. As you're turning there, let me ask you a question this morning. Uh, why is the resurrection so important in the Christian faith? Now, well, why is the resurrection so important? I, I mean, this is a day that we celebrate. It's a day that we come to church. I mean, even if someone's a little bit sick, I, I mean, you still come. You don't want to miss Resurrection Sunday. Now, now, we can say that in America that we have uh, made it too big of a deal. We've you know, commercialized it way too much. And, and for some of that, I, I would say true. Have we commercialized it a little bit too much? Yeah. I, I was looking at just this week some stats on, on Easter week and this weekend. And Easter is the seventh top-selling week of the U, U.S. retail. of Americans will celebrate this holiday and spend an average of $192.01. I won't ask you if you went over or lower on your meal this week. 25% of Americans who celebrate Easter aren't even religious. Easter is the number one holiday for milk chocolate sales. Does there anybody say amen for that? Uh, According to the National Revenue Federation, $24 billion will be spent on, on Easter. So I would say in some sense, true, we have commercialized it way too much, but I will say false on the side that we have made it too big of a deal. Listen, we must remember that this Sunday is a big deal in the Christian faith, what we celebrate, what we get to sing about. Listen, I am all for the celebrations, for the family gatherings. I've been even good with some chocolate and an Easter egg hunt. As long as you remember and you keep the main thing, the main thing. As long as you teach it to your kids, as long as you go forth, you know that from behind and around you, in front of you, that the cornerstone of our faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That the cornerstone to what we do, this is how the Apostle Paul says it in 1 Corinthians. He he says, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching's in vain. And our faith is in vain. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Listen, Paul realizes the resurrection. He realizes that we have no hope apart from it. That if it wasn't for the resurrection, that we'd still be in our sin. If it wasn't for the resurrection, then why do we preach? Why do we have this faith? It's futile. It's nothing. If that's the case, we might as well just eat, drink, because tomorrow is the end and it's done. You see, the resurrection is crucial and of the utmost importance to our faith. The great London preacher Charles Spurgeon said, The resurrection of our divine Lord from the dead is the cornerstone of Christian doctrine. Perhaps I might more accurately call it the keystone of the arch of Christianity. For if that fact could be disproven, the whole fabric of the gospel would fall to the ground. If you disprove the resurrection, listen, the good news is no longer good news. The good news of the gospel, what we sing about, is no longer good news. If you lose the resurrection, church, you lose the gospel. So church, should we make a deal about, a big deal about this Sunday, yes or no? Yes. You can call it Easter Sunday. You can call it Resurrection Sunday. You can put Bible verses in the Easter eggs or you can put chocolate. I I don't care what you do. As long as you celebrate our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And, And we let this be the cornerstone of our life today, tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day after that. Because all the stories that we read and that we understand about Jesus, all those stories are true because he rose from the grave. We can believe all those 
because he rose from the grave. And so I want to give you three, three points today as we look at three sections of Scripture. And we're going to look, though, I want you to turn to John chapter 20 and look at verse 18. This is the last verse that we will look at, but it's kind of the hinge of everything else that we look at. And so I want us to read this one verse, and then we'll go back and read the rest of the text. But here's what John chapter 18, verse 20 says. It says, Mary Magdalene went and announced to her disciples, and look at this phrase, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. I want us to stop, and I want us to think about that statement for a second as she says, I have seen the Lord. I I want you to see Jesus today. No, I'm not saying physically see him today, but, but the word of God was given to us so that we can see him. It, it, it says in Hebrews, it says in Hebrews that the word of God is living and active. It says in Hebrews that we look to Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. And and I like how Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, he he says that the eyes of our hearts will be enlightened. The eyes of our heart, that we'll be able to see him with the eyes of our heart. I I want you to see Jesus today. Not not literally. I'm not meaning some strange way. We have a society where people think they see Jesus in everything. I, I got on the internet and kind of got a little kick and started to see that some of the things that people just think they see Jesus, they think they saw Jesus in a Cheeto in 2013. This was a big deal. It kind of went around the news. In 2010, they thought they saw him in a frying pan. And this went viral for a while. Also in 2011, a couple said they saw him in this receipt at Walmart. I mean, a Walmart receipt. They saw Jesus. And then in 2011, Jesus was in this pizza crust. Now, this one right here went on eBay and sold for $158. 26 people bid for that. And then maybe the granddaddy of them all is Donna Lee found Jesus in a pierogi and sold it on eBay for $1,775. Listen, as long as she gave it to the church, I guess that's fine, but that's not what I'm talking about today. Well, we're not going to see Jesus now. I want the eyes of your heart to see Jesus. And so let's look back. Let's start as we look at three sections here and start in chapter 19, actually, a couple of verses. Look at verse 40 as we look at the first one. And so they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Here's the first thing that I want you to see. I want you to see his victory as they laid him in the tomb. Listen, why, why do we see the tomb as a defeat? So let me encourage you, don't see the tomb as a defeat. Let me ask you this question. Do you think Satan, even for a second, thought that he had won? I mean, think about it. Do you think Satan, for a second, thought that he had won? I I know we sing some songs that that, that say that heaven held its breath and waited. Uh, And the demons, I understand the demons and the angels, they, they don't know everything. They were all watching it unfold also. But please understand, it wasn't that Jesus went to a grave for three days that Satan partied. I think Satan always knew that he had lost. I don't think he ever thought that he had victory. Yes, there is silence of Saturday. We know Jesus went to the grave. We know on Friday, we know on Sunday in chapter 20 that he rose from the grave. But with the silence of Saturday, the disciples, as they didn't know what was going to happen, what was going to take place, they thought their Savior was dead. Please know that Jesus was not silent. Jesus was not silent. We don't have time to look at the whole theology of what Jesus did on that Saturday, but there are some interesting verses as you study through the scriptures. I'll give you just one place. In 1 Peter, it says this, For Christ also suffered for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Okay, he was dead in the flesh, but alive in the spirit. And then what did he do? In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. 
So in the spirit, he went and proclaimed to other spirits. Did you mind? What did he proclaim? Well, what is that talking about? Well, Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, he says this, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. Now understand, as you look at Paul's writing, when he talks about rulers and authorities and dominions, he's not talking about earthly, physical rulers and authorities. He's talking about a spiritual realm of authorities and, and rulers. He says this, he says he disarmed the rulers and authorities by putting them to open shame by triumphing over them because of the cross. He said, Jeremiah, what did Jesus do on Saturday? Listen, he went to the rulers and to the authorities and the dominions and powers uh, above this, this physical world. Ephesians 1 talks about that, how he's above all rulers and authorities and powers and dominions. He went to them and declared his victory. He went to all the demonic forces. He went to everything and said, listen, I have won. Listen, yes, there was silence on earth, but I believe Jesus was busy on Saturday. And he was declaring that he was victorious. He was saying that he went, don't think of it as the movies, that you know in the movies, they, there's always that part of the movies where the hero's like on the ground and getting beaten, and, and everybody thinks they won, and they're celebrating, you think the, 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 the hero's like down and out? Listen, don't, don't think of that when Jesus went to the tomb. Jesus was victorious. And listen, Satan always knew this. Satan could go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, it says that Satan will be crushed You go through the scriptures and all through the Old Testament, you see this. That's why Satan tried to tempt Jesus in Matthew and said, listen, why don't you bow down to me? Satan knew if he didn't get Jesus on his side, he had lost. There's no way he was going to win. You see, Satan, he doesn't know the future. He only knows what God has revealed to him. And what God has revealed to him was that he lost and that he is defeated. You see, this tomb of Jesus is not a place of defeat. I want you to see the tomb as a place where Jesus declared the victory. Where Jesus declared the victory, he had won, and all dominions and all authorities were being told of his victory. Jesus was declaring that he had won. He is victorious. Church, what a savior that we have. But, but it doesn't end there. The second thing that I want you to see is I want you to see his fulfilling the scripture when he rose. Look at chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and and went to summon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, which would have been John, and and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciples, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciples outran Peter, reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there. But he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there. And the faith cloth, face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, now lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Listen, this is for all you neat freaks. Jesus was clean. He was neat. Right here. You see this? He folded it up neatly and put it there. Then the other disciples who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. But look at this, but as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Here's the, the second thing I want you to see is that yes, fulfilling the scriptures was how he, when he rose from the grave. It was the Old Testament had already declared that he would rise from the grave. Now, I'm sure as they look back, they missed a lot of that as they read the Psalms, they read Isaiah. We can see in Psalms now, in Psalms 16, in Psalms 22, uh, looking back on the cross, through the cross, it's easier to see these pictures. And and we don't have time to study out Psalms 16 and Psalms 22 right now, but in those texts, it shows that yes, he is going to die, but he is also going to rise from the grave. 
We get to Isaiah chapter 53, and it also in Isaiah 53 talks about how he will be pierced, how he will, he will die, he will be crushed. But it also in that text talks about how there is resurrection that is there. Maybe one of the clearest pictures of the Old Testament that we see is in the book of Jonah. We see Jonah's life. Jesus is the one that pointed this out. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. You see, Jesus says, listen, the Scriptures have shown us. The Scriptures have has pointed to this. You say, Jeremiah, why, why is it so significant that Jesus fulfilled the Scriptures by rising from the grave? Why is that so significant? I'll give you just a couple reasons real quick. Number one, it shows that no surprise was on God's part. It also shows us a no defeat in God's plan. Listen, when we understand that all the way from the beginning that God showed us that, yes, his son was going to come, that he was going to rise from the grave, and that he was going to continue to continue on in power, this was all through the scriptures. It shows us that none of this took God by surprise. And none of this was a defeat in God's plan. This was God's plan all along. It wasn't like God saw this happening. Okay, now I got to take a nine degree because Jesus went to the cross and I got to do this because I got to get to here. No, this was God's plan the whole way. You see, he is all powerful. Past, present, and future. He is all powerful. So here's where it really hits home. If we believe this, if we believe that no surprise was on God's part, that no defeat was in God's plan, that all power is God's, if we believe that he is that big of a God, then this is where it has to come to the place in our heart where I ask you this question is, can he take care of your life? I don't know about that. Can he handle that situation in your life? You see, we can celebrate that he is all-powerful. We can celebrate that the scriptures, that, be, that thousands of years before Jesus even came, that it was prophesied that he would come and that he would die and that he would rise from the grave. We can celebrate all that. We can say, what a powerful, what a mighty God that we serve. But then my question is to you, when you walk out those doors and you live tomorrow and the next day, can he take care of your problems? Can he take care of your life? Is he worthy enough to handle the situations that you're walking through right now? Is he worthy enough to give us, to give him our life? You see, sometimes I feel like we come with this theology and this understanding of who God is, and we know he's powerful, we know he's big, we know he's majestic. But then when it really comes to our everyday life, we don't really live with that type of theology. I don't know. I mean, can God really take care of my spouse? Can he really change my spouse's heart? I mean, Jesus rising from the grave, my spouse, I don't know. That's how we live a lot. Church, listen to me. If we're going to understand what the scriptures have said, and we believe that, yes, it has all been prophesied. This is all taking place. This is part of God's plan. This is all no surprise to God. Then we have to believe that he is a powerful and a big God. And if he is, the only thing that we can do is bow before that God. The only thing that we can do is bow before him and say, you are worthy. You see, Jesus comes here and and all this, as John wants us to know, is that this was declared in the Scriptures. This was not taken anybody by surprise. And then the third, it says, I want you to see his care for his followers. Now, look then at verse 11. It says, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one on his head and uh, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. H having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir... If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. 
Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. You see, Jesus really, in the rest of the book of John, we'll look at over the next couple of weeks as we finish walking through the Gospel of John, what Jesus done in the, does in the rest of John is showing his care and his love for his disciples. He starts here with Mary, and then he comes to his disciples and Thomas, and, and then eventually in John 21, where he sits down with Peter uh, around the fire, what Jesus is doing is helping them understand what happened and also sharing with them the good news and, and making sure they don't question anything. He wants them to know, this is what happened. This is my care. This is what has taken place. So he first here appears to Mary Magdalene. Listen, don't, don't miss the significance of Jesus appearing to a lady first. We, we could go off on a whole message about this, and we'll hunt another day, another time. But see careful and understand the care and the respect that Jesus had for the women that followed him. The greatest news of all time that he had risen from the grave was given to Mary Magdalene to tell all. Women have always played a significant role in the story of Jesus, and they still do today. Now, look at the statement that Jesus tells Mary to say. He says, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. 108 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus calls God his Father. 27 of those times, he says, that is my father. This is the only time in the Gospel of John that Jesus now says, he is your father. And, and this is also the only time in the Gospel of John that we see Jesus call his disciples brothers. You see, John is showing us a crucial turning point in history right here. It is here that we are no longer enemies of God. It is here that no longer there is this divide between man and God. That no, we can now be called the sons and daughters of God. Because of what Jesus did, we can have true peace and we can call him Father. We can call him our God. The Father is now our Father. God is now our God. Our sins has been forgiven, and our relationship with the Father is now possible. You see, Jesus looks at Mary and says, make sure when you go back and you tell the disciples, my brothers, that you make sure that you tell them that my God is their God, that my Father is their Father. You see, this statement right here, was a statement of Jesus explaining to them, beginning to show them his care for them and, and what is going to happen and, and how they will continue to carry this message on. You see, the resurrection opened the door for us who put their faith in Jesus Christ to now also call God the Father our Father. Just as Jesus tells his disciples, yes, we too can call him Father. As Stephanie comes and we get ready to close, look at this quote from Tim Keller. He says this, if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. So it doesn't matter all the teaching if we don't get to this place right here. This is the pinnacle. This is the cornerstone. This is the keystone, whatever you want to call it, of our faith rests on Jesus coming back from the grave. So here's what I want to ask you. In your heart right now, I want you to answer this question. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the grave? Answer that in your heart right now. Yes or no? It's not really a middle ground. Will you answer that? Do you believe that Jesus rose from the grave? Now, if you do, if you say yes, he rose from the grave, then listen, there has to be no doubt that he is God. 
No one else could do that. And so if he is God, then I think the only other question that we have to answer is this, is will I surrender my life to follow Jesus? If he is God, if we truly believe that he is God, then the only question I have to answer is will I surrender my life to follow Jesus? For either you will look at him and either you will see him today and say, yes, he is my king, or you will look at him today and say, no, and I will walk away and do what I want with my life. You say, Jeremiah, I, I, I believe in Jesus. I was at the gym the other day and talking to somebody and asked them if they we were talking about Easter and asked them they went to church. And, and he said, no, I, I don't really go to church, but I, I just, I believe in God. And that's, you know, that's kind of, I, I believe in God. Now listen, the Bible says that, and he said he prayed to God too. That was other thing. He said he prayed to God. You know, the Pharisees prayed to God. The Pharisees did. Listen, just because you pray to quote unquote a God doesn't mean that you're saved. Listen, please understand the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. And the only way through to Jesus Christ is through repentance and surrender to Him. If He is Lord, if He is God, then the only thing we can do is either bow before Him or we walk away saying, I don't need Him. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground that we can walk. So I ask you, what does your life look like today? What does your life look like today? Just knowing the story of Jesus and praying does not mean that you are saved. I think there are many that pray to, quote unquote, God, that will someday stand before God, and he will look at them and say, I never knew you. Listen, the only way to God is through Jesus, and the only way to Jesus is to come and repentant and surrender in your life. It's the only way. We love the resurrection, for the resurrection declares that Jesus is everything that he says he was. Everything that he said, all the miracles, all the teachings, they all come to this pinnacle. If he rose from the grave, then yes, those are all true. And so now we have to stand here and say, where well, I surrender my life to him. So I ask you today, I don't know why you came. I don't know if you came with family. I don't know if you came just because this is Easter and so you come on this Sunday. But listen, will you please answer this question before you leave? Will you surrender your life to Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who is over all, who is through all, who is in all? He is the Messiah. Will you surrender your life? It's not just a knowledge of him. It's just not knowing the story. It's not, maybe you were even baptized as a kid. Maybe you've prayed. That's, that's not it. Listen, I'm asking you, have you surrendered your life to him? Have you repented of your sin and given your life to Jesus Christ? Will you see Jesus today? Will you bow your head and close your eyes with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed. We're going to stand here in a second, we're going to sing, and we're going to be done, but I don't want to take long, but listen, if you are here today, and you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, and you feel in your heart the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and you say, Jeremiah, I don't know if I am truly saved. Jeremiah, I don't know, I've maybe prayed a prayer, I believe God is about, I've never really given my life. I've never come in a repentant surrender to him. You say, Jeremiah, I don't know if I'm truly saved. Will you pray for me? Listen, I, I want to pray for you. I, I'm not going to call you out. I, I want to pray for you. And so if you say, Jeremiah, I don't know if I'm truly saved, will you just slip your hand up and put it down? Just put it up real quick and put it down. Heads about her eyes closed. Just slip it up and put it down so I can pray for you. Say, Jeremiah, I don't know if I am truly saved. I had a lady the first service who came up to me after and said, I need to be saved. Listen, don't, don't let that rush by. If God is doing something in your heart, you say, Jeremiah, will you pray for me? You just slip it up and put it down. 
They pray for me, Jeremiah. I, I don't know. In light of eternity, I, I don't know where I stand. If you're lost here today and you said, Jeremiah, I don't know. If I were to die, I'd spend eternity in heaven. Then listen, there's no magical prayer. It, it is you saying, Jesus, I am lost. I need a Savior. That I've been trying to run my life on my own and I repent of my sin today. I believe that you are the Son of God. And through your death and resurrection, I can have true life. Come into my life and be King and be Lord. Listen, if you need to talk with someone, Pastor Justin's in the back. You can go back there any time at the end. I'll be up here. Pastor Justin will also be up here. I pray that you won't walk out, that you will come and you will talk to one of us. We'd love to share with you how you can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you know that he is your Lord and Savior, then is there any part of your life that you have not surrendered to him or that you've taken back? Then will you give it to him today? Father, we come before you today and acknowledging that you are over all, that you had this perfect plan all along, and, and we thank you, Lord. I know I, I'm a sinner. If it was not for Jesus, I would not be able to be here today. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and for uh, taking my sin and bearing my iniquities, taking my chastisement. And thank you that you sealed that as you rose from the grave, that you are victorious, that you won. And God, I pray if there's anybody here who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of their repentance, that they'd come, they'd talk to somebody. God, that you would be exalted, that the angels would rejoice. And so we praise you, we thank you, and we continue to celebrate who you are. And we give you praise, we give you glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Church, let's stand together and let's sing again as we declare that he is alive. He rose from the grave. Let's sing it out together. He did, he did, who paid for all of our sin. Nobody but Jesus, who pulled me out of that pain. He did, he did. power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Do you believe that this morning? Amen, church. What a great Easter morning to be gathered with you all. So glad that you are here. Uh, honored that you could make it. If you want to talk to somebody after the service, maybe you made a decision today. Maybe you want to talk about things a little further. Pastor Justin will be down here on your left. Pastor Jeremiah will be here in the center. But thank you everyone for coming. Please be careful as you leave the parking lot. 1115 people are bound to be pulling in while you're going out. And if you know our hill at all, it's a little treacherous in the best of days. So just be careful and know that today and every day you are loved.